Good afternoon, and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. My name is Terrell Pruitt. I'm a councilperson in the City of Cleveland. I represent Ward 1, as well as a soldier of Harm National Guard. I am uh, currently a major, as well as a veteran of the War of Afghanistan. It's my privilege, and I'm proud to introduce our speaker today, Melissa Stockwell. Twelve years ago, Melissa was a recent co college graduate leaving the University of Colorado for a commission as a second lieutenant in the United States Army Transportation Corps. In March of 2004, she deployed with the 1st Cavalry Division to Baghdad, Iraq. Just one month later, a roadside bomb hit her Humvee. Ms. Stockwell became the first female to lose a limb in Operation Iraqi Freedom. She spent a year at Walter Reed Army Medical Center, undergoing multiple surgeries and rehabilitation. In 2005, she was medically retired from the Army and awarded the Purple Heart and the Bronze Star. That injury, that year in the hospital, that's sort of where her story begins. It was at Walter Reed Hospital where she learned of the Paralympic Games. Three years later, she worked her way to compete and serve on the 2008 Paralympic Games swim team, and she hit it for Beijing. Although she didn't medal, she won a lot of hearts, and she was honored to be able to carry our nation's flag in the closing ceremonies in the bird's nest. Today, Melissa Stockwell completes as a, in the para triathlon, which includes swimming, running, and biking. She's made her mission one of occlusion, encouraging and coaching others to compete in para triathlons throughout the organization she co-founded, Dare to Try. Ms. Stockwell also joined the Wounded Warriors Project Board of Directors. She credits the Wounded Warriors Project with getting her up out of her hospital bed and onto the ski slopes, which made her realize she can do anything with one leg or two. I just want to take a point of privilege and also talk about the state of our nation's military. As you know, we, we have an honored force that are all volunteers. Less than 1% of Americans serve in armed services. It's a collection of many great young people many folks from all different backgrounds. And for the young folks in the, in the audience, as you are planning on your lives, the chance and the honor to be able to wear our nation's uniform is one of distinction. And it's something that you should also consider as options for yourselves. We have many great veterans that serve, at, that serve our communities after they leave the service. And we're honored to have one of them speaking with us tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, members of the City Club, is my, please join me and welcome Melissa Stockwell. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the, the wonderful introduction, the kind welcome. A big thank you to Dan, to Bob and Sally Grease for their hospitality and just for being here today. Um, I'm here today actually with my service dog, Jake, who is quietly sitting under the table for now. He's, um, he's heard my story before. <laughs> but afterwards, um, he'll come up on stage and you can feel free to, to pet him or ask questions or, or whatever you like. So today I'm going to tell you my story. I'm going to share with you things that I've learned lessons that have changed me, made me a better person, led to my successful life as an athlete and a businesswoman. My story is about disability, but it's about realizing that in, in real life, it's not about a disability, but it's about ability, and it's about what somebody is capable of instead of what somebody is no longer able to do. As I tell you my story, I hope you can take any inspiration and knowledge that I have and, and make it your own, and hopefully you'll walk away today with some knowledge of thinking that you can go out and be greater than the great person than all of you already are. 
So my story, well, the most dramatic part of it at least, was on April 13, 2004. We were newly arrived in country, in Iraq. We were all young, eager to do our jobs, dedicated. We, my vehicle had just gone under an underpass, and suddenly this big boom, this big explosion goes off. And there I was, a 24-year-old first lieutenant, and my vehicle had been struck by a roadside bomb. I looked down, I saw a bunch of blood, and I knew that my life was forever changed. But I knew at that moment, not at that moment, but many years later, I had what some people would call a desirable difficulty. And that's what I want to explain to you today, because it was desirable. And I want all of you to embrace the good things that come your way in life, but sometimes the unfortunate things that happen turn out to be the greatest blessings of all. And that's where my story starts. My story is ultimately one of faith in myself, in my country, and really in all of you. It's a story of triumph over what could have been a tragedy. It's a story of believing in myself and the concept of team and leadership and believing that all of us can do whatever it is we want, regardless of the obstacles that the fate might throw at us. So my story really starts in a gymnastics gym. I was a gymnast. I was at the gym every day. I dreamt of going to the Olympics like any young gymnast would. I would stand on that gymnastics mat and I would have that hand, my hand over my heart and I would imagine myself getting a perfect 10 on that American flag as they played the national anthem. And that turned into a love of the red, the white, and the blue and, and the patriotism. And then as I grew older, wanting to give back. And I realized that by wearing a military uniform, I had that flag patch on my shoulder and I'd be able to give back to this country that I loved so much from a young age. So my story eventually brought me out to the University of Colorado where um, I continued in my athletic pursuits of crew and of rowing and diving. And, but freshman year, I would see these cadets marching around campus in their ROTC uniform, and I could sense the camaraderie and teamwork, and I knew that I, I wanted to be part of that. So sophomore year, I did just that. I went to the Army recruiter. If, you, if, if any of you have been in the military, been to a recruiter, and you walk in saying you want to be in the Army, well, they hand you that paperwork pretty quickly. <laughs> So I signed on that dotted line. He quickly handed me over my first set of BDUs, my military uniform, battle dress uniform. I went home that night. I put that uniform on, and I knew that that's where I was supposed to be. I loved it. The pride I felt with that uniform on, that flag patch on my shoulder, and I knew that's what I was meant to do. Now, I don't come from a military family, so imagine my parents' surprise when I called them and said, guess what, Mom and Dad? I'm going to join ROTC. And there's kind of this silence on the other, other end of the line, like it can be a little awkward sometimes with your parents. And then suddenly my dad blurts out, they allow girls in the army? <laughs> so it was very much unknown, but they do. And I got to rappel down rocks. I got to paint my face with camo. I got to roll around in the woods. I got to have these leaders. I got to learn leadership qualities because of camaraderie with my other cadets. And I loved it. I loved ROTC. I loved marching around campus. And I just loved being a part of something something bigger. So senior year, a day that none of us will ever forget, September 11, 2001, a day that changed all of our lives and you know, really changed the world. And this day, I remember it, as all of us do, it was a Tuesday. I was in my ROTC uniform like every other Tuesday, sitting in the classroom watching the news unfold on TV. And it was then that our instructor said, today your lives are going to change. It's not a matter of if you're going to deploy, it's a matter of when you're going to deploy. So I knew at that moment that that uniform I was so proud to wear, I wasn't just going to wear it on American soil, but I'd be wearing it on foreign soil as well. So first, a few months later, in May of 2002, I, was, I graduated from college. I was commissioned as a second lieutenant into the United States Army with my proud parents by my side. And I set off to what was supposed to be four years of active duty, or so I thought. We had been in Iraq for about three weeks, and we had completed several daily convoys. And the fateful day of April 13th, 2004, started out just like any other. Woke up early, got my briefing, got into my vehicle. There were no doors on my vehicle at the time. It was early on in the war. There was no armor. It didn't really matter. We didn't really think about it. We had a mission, and we were going to do it regardless of what we had. So this particular day, I was going to a place called the Green Zone. So. If there's any cool place to go in Iraq, it was the Green Zone. It was right in central Baghdad, Saddam's palaces, the cross sabers. And all I had to do that day was ride along. I really had no mission. 
because the next day I was going to take over on the route. So I just had to sit in that vehicle, learn the route, and then the next day I was going to take over. It was actually supposed to be a pretty fun day, in quotes, where, you know, I had my flak vest on. I actually had my camera on my vest because I was going to take some pictures. But as many of you know, things don't always go as planned. And we started that convoy about 10 minutes into it. We went under this bridge, and this big boom goes off. The explosion goes off. The woman in the front yells, IED, IED. We've hit an IED. IED meant roadside bomb. My vehicle had been struck by a roadside bomb. I looked up. The windshield was cracked. The vehicle swerved. We ended up ricocheting off of a guardrail and ricocheting, swerving back to the right and crashing into this Iraqi woman's house. And we had been through situations like this in training. That's what training is for. And everybody executed it perfectly. They got out of the vehicle, surrounded it, pointed their weapons out to assess the situation to see what was going to happen next. So I started to do just that. Started to undo my seatbelt, look down. Like I said, saw a bunch of blood, and I called out, I'm hurt. Something happened to my leg. I'm hurt. And lucky for me, there was a combat medic who was a few vehicles back. He heard me calling out. He ran up to my vehicle. He pulled me out by my flak vest, my bulletproof vest, laid me there next to the vehicle, and started to administer a first aid. What I didn't know then, but I know now, is that not only was he administering first aid, but he was saving my life. My leg had, was gone. It had been severed. I was losing a lot of blood. And I, as I laid there, I had no idea. Nobody told me my leg was gone. I, I, I was laying down, so I, I couldn't see it. And I've always tended to be pretty optimistic, so in my mind I'm thinking, this can't be as bad as everyone's making it out to be. And, you know, I kept thinking I was moving my foot. It's, I know now it's a sensation called phantom pain or phantom sensation where you think you have a limb, but you don't. And it wasn't until the medic put a tourniquet on when I knew it probably wasn't so good because we all knew that when a tourniquet went on, whatever was below that was really no longer. So it was then that the pain started. I realized it probably wasn't as good as I thought. And all the commotion that was going on around me, I knew that my life that day was forever changed. It was hard to believe that just a year earlier, I was at my first duty assignment at, Fer at, at Fort Hood, Texas, part of the 1st Cavalry Division. I was 23 years old. My first duty assignment, I was put in charge of these soldiers, these millions of dollars worth of equipment, a really challenging time, but one that I was excited about and excited to take that challenge. And in early 2004, orders came down that the 1st Cav Division was going to deploy to Iraq. So that meant me. I knew back in college that my time was going to come, and this was it. So the, the uniforms I had quickly transitioned into the DCUs, the desert camouflage ones for the desert. Our vehicles were painted from the green to the desert sand color. And then in March of 2004, myself and thousands of my best friends boarded a plane. We had our weapons, our Kevlars, our flak vest to head over, which was for the next year of our life, over to Iraq where we were going to do what we signed up to do. We all volunteered, and we were going to go and defend our country. So we get to a Kuwait. We land. It's very surreal. You don't actually think you're going to be there until you land. You step off, and the heat hits you, and you think, holy cow, here I am. We're in Kuwait for about two weeks, and we make the long trip up from Kuwait up into Iraq. A long convoy, a whole bunch of vehicles. You cross the border. Your heart starts to beat a little faster. You get to the bustling city of Baghdad, and there's Iraqis everywhere. You're not sure who's the good person, who's the bad guy. Are you going to, what, what's going to happen your day to day? But then finally we got to where I was going to be for the next year, which was a place called Taji. It's directly north of Baghdad. And you get there and you kind of settle in and figure out what your new life is going to be like. Over in Iraq, I had, I had two jobs. My first one was my favorite because I got to be in charge of 20 of the finest men and women that I've ever known. A lot of them just out of high school trying to find their way in the world. And they found themselves with me as their leader, over in this far away, far away place, this home away from home. But just like in any team, you become, you become a family. And we became a family, a home away from home. My second job and my daily job was a convoy commander. So a whole bunch of vehicles, I, I would be in charge of leading them from one point to the next, delivering various supplies. I'd be in charge of communications with headquarters, the route, the soldiers, just kind of making sure everything went as planned. I'd been there for about three weeks, done many convoys, and I took great pride in everything I was doing. I was serving my country that I love dearly. 
I was leading soldiers. I was carrying out missions. I just never thought that a roadside bomb would come into the mix. Because when you're over there, you always think it's going to be somebody else. And it's never supposed to be you. But from the sands of Iraq, I was lifted. I was put in the back of a big five-ton vehicle, a big pickup truck. I was driven to the nearest aid station and put in the back of a helicopter and flown, coincidentally enough, to the green zone. So I got there, just not how I planned on it. <laughs> I was taken out the helicopter, put on a stretcher, wheeled into a hospital, and someone called out, you're safe now. You're in an American hospital. I was rushed into a life-saving surgery. I was losing a lot of blood. I woke up. I still had a T on my forehead, which meant tourniquet. So if someone found me on the battlefield, they knew I had a life-threatening injury. I looked over to the gentleman next to me, and I said, I think I'm hurt. What if something happened to my leg? And that's where he looked at me, and he said, your leg is gone. You don't have it anymore. And that day, my, my real life's journey was really just beginning. And many years later, I can tell you that stubbornness and optimism can bring you a long way. So from the battlefield, from Baghdad, I was flown to Launchville, Germany, which is where everyone went on their way back home to the United States to kind of to get to, to, to be stabilized before making a long trip back to the US. And it just so happens that timing was pretty great, because my sister lived in Vienna. My dad was on business in Slovakia. So the day after I lost my leg, I got to have my sister and my dad rush into my hospital room and be by my side. Talk about starting things off on the right foot, literally the right foot. <laughs> so I was at Lawn Show for a few days, and then I made my way to Walter Reed. At the time, Walter Reed is where all the wounded soldiers went from Iraq and Afghanistan. And you get there, and you're not quite sure what to make of things. And it was there that my mom met me. So now instead of just my dad and my sister, I had my mom by my side. And I was able to start my, my year-long recovery with both my parents and trying to figure out whatever my new normal was. If you've ever been to Walter Reed, you know that it's a powerful place. And what I mean by that is that I would looked around and I saw other soldiers that were missing two limbs, three limbs, four limbs, their eyesight, traumatic brain injury. And I looked at myself and I was just missing one leg and I thought, Holy cow, am I lucky. I felt so lucky because I had the rest of me. Not to mention that I was alive because too many soldiers give the ultimate sacrifice. So I made a promise then to live my life for those that gave that ultimate sacrifice and didn't make it back. And I wanted to live my life as though I had all my limbs and still be a proud American and do the things that I wanted to do. I did get a Purple Heart, but Walter Reed was made so great by the nurses, by the doctors, by the surgeons, not to mention family and friends that stopped whatever they were doing and flew to be by my bedside, just knowing that the support was there. But Walter Reed can also be trying, as you can imagine. I'd gone 24 years of my life with both my legs, suddenly I'm missing one. So you lay in your hospital bed and you wonder what your life will be like. Will you walk? Will you run? Will I be independent again? And luckily at Walter Reed, you had these other soldiers to look through to, to, to motivation. A guy, that had, a guy that had come ahead of me by a month, he was, had a similar injury, and he was up and walking. So now I knew that in a month, maybe I'd be up and walking. But luckily, there was a lot of activities there to kind of help pass the time. And being a wounded soldier at Walter Reed, we had a lot of visitors, whether they were politicians, celebrities, higher-ranking officers. And two of my favorites I like to share. Um, the first one was Tom Hanks. And he came in my room, very genuine, sat there and talked for a good, a good while. On the opposite end of the spectrum, the Osbournes, <laughs> where they, they, they come in the room, you're not quite sure what to make of them, this huge celebrity couple, and um, Sharon is sitting there, I don't know what to say, Ozzy's on some stack of like 10 chairs, and um, you know, you just kind of make small talk. But it didn't really matter, it didn't matter who it was, it helped pass the time, and, that, and at that point, that's what we needed. At Walter Reed, I also learned it's OK to celebrate the loss of a leg. <laughs> Sounds strange. But a lot of soldiers call it their alive day. And basically, every year on the day that you're injured, you celebrate what you still have instead of mourning what you lost. You celebrate your ability, not your disability. So I, so I promised to do just that. And I named what was left in my leg, Little Leg. <laughs> and I promised that every year, we were going to have a birthday for Little Leg. And we were going to celebrate her, <laughs> and that I was going to be thankful 
that I was still here and still alive and could do the things that I wanted to do. And I was thankful because 52 days after I lost my leg, I was down in physical therapy. I was regaining the strength I had lost. And then a few days later, I was being fit with my first prosthetic leg. Now, I, d I know that I don't remember learning how to walk when I was younger. If anybody does, I'd be pretty impressed. I'd actually like to hear that story later. So when you get fit with this prosthetic leg, it's this piece of metal and plastic, and there's a series of measurements. And then came the day where I was sitting there in the parallel bars, and they said, all right, you're going to stand up and you're going to walk. And I thought, well, how the heck am I going to do this? But I looked across the physical therapy room, and there's a gentleman missing both of his legs and an arm, and he's up and walking. So what excuse do I have? And then you walk. And I started in the parallel bars, moved to crutches, and then a cane, and then before I knew it, I was, gonna, I was on my own. And I knew that life was going to go on, and I was going to be independent again. And as exciting as this day was, an even more exciting day, I like to call Melissa Stockwell 2.0. <laughs> and this day, somebody came into my hospital room to tell me that I could still be involved in sports. I'd been an athlete when I was younger. I knew I wasn't going to be myself again until I got back into some sort of athletics. And they came in and they said, how would you like to go to the New York City Marathon and do the marathon? And I thought, well, that's a little crazy. That's 26.2 miles, right? But somehow, I got to that starting line. I, I did it on a bike that I powered with my arms. So it was on a bike called a hand cycle. And three months after I was injured, I went to New York City. I did that marathon. I crossed that finish line. And my competitive spirit was renewed. I knew that I could still be out there doing things I wanted to do. And then, a few months earlier, someone from the Wounded Warrior Project came in my room and said, how would you like to go on a ski trip? And at that point, I could barely even get from my hospital room, from my hospital bed to my wheelchair on my own. So how was I going to ski? But somehow, December of that year, I found myself out in Breckenridge, Colorado, starting out pretty wobbly at first on the ski slope, not quite sure what to do. But by the end of the week, taking that chairlift all the way up, coming down, the wind in my hair, trying not to be reckless, and I never felt so free in my entire life. And I went back to Walter Reed with my chest held high, and I thought, if I can do that, then I can do anything. And this became as a really good time because someone came to Walter Reed and talked about the US Paralympics, which at the time I knew nothing about, which kind of blows my mind because it's such a big part of my life right now. But they said that in 2008, in four years, there was going to be a Paralympic Games. It was going to be two weeks after the Olympics. It was going to be in Beijing, China. And if I trained hard enough that I could go, I could represent the country I defended in Iraq. I could wear a USA uniform, and I could compete on the world's biggest athletic stage. Somehow or some way, I had to get there. So first, I was medically retired from the Army, Purple Heart and a Bronze Star in April of 2005. And I moved up to Minnesota. Why Minnesota? Well, April 13th of 04 changed my life in more than one. Not only did I have a newfound love for life and passion for life, I wanted to be a Paralympian, but I also had a new career. And I went back to school to learn how to fit other amputees with artificial limbs, a career that has been more rewarding than I ever could have imagined. But also, this goal of making the 2008 Paralympic swim team and just like when I was younger, I would go to school and I would train and go back and train and train and train with this goal. Now, why swimming? Well, it was really easy for me to get into the pool. I didn't have to wear a prosthetic leg. I could just get in with my crutches, get some laps in, and the water really made me feel whole again. So, swam a lot of laps, thousands of laps. My times were pretty, pretty, pretty darn slow at first, and I would gradually see them improve the longer I spent in the pool. When I graduated from school for prosthetics, it was late 2007, and my times weren't where they needed to be. And time was of the essence. I had a year and a half left before the Paralympic Games. So I made a decision, and I moved out to the Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs. I swam, I ate, I slept, and I did that over and over and over again with this hopes of making this dream come true. And in April of 2008, almost four years to the day after I lost my leg, there was a Paralympic trials. I went into it a long shot to make the team. My times were here. They needed to be here. I went into it. I swam in three events. 
And as cheesy as it sounds, I found out that that day that dreams do come true and that hard work does pay off. I broke American records I didn't, e I didn't even know existed. I took 20 seconds off of a 400 freestyle. And it was a day that I think, think, think back about and wish I could relive over and over again. And the next day when they named the Paralympic swim team and they named my name, there's th this whole flood of emotion and this journey from Baghdad to Beijing, it just kind of all, it all made sense. And then Beijing, Beijing Paralympics are two weeks after the Olympic Games, so I got to watch on TV as Michael Phelps won his eight gold medals in the water queue, the state-of-the-art venue they built just for the Olympic Games. And then a few weeks later, I found myself standing in that water cube, imagining of getting gold and dropping another 20 seconds off, because that was realistic, <laughs> and standing on that podium. Because what greater honor would it be to get that gold medal and hear that national anthem? And I wish I could tell you that that did happen. I swam in three events. I had a poor meet, of all places to have a bad swim meet. I didn't make best times, I didn't make finals, and at the end of the meet, I was so down on myself. I thought I had let everybody down. My family, my friends, my coach, my teammates, my country. I had 20 family and friends that flew over and stood up in the stands with a flag that said Little Leg Fan Club. <laughs> and I thought I had let them down also. At the end, I got a participation medal, which I wanted to chuck out the window at the time, because <laughs> I came that far and that's all I got. But I learned a really important lesson. And that's it. a lot of times in life, it's not, about, it's not about the medals, it's not about standing on top of that podium, it's about the journey to get someplace and overcoming obstacles. And I knew my team agreed with that because at the end of the Paralympic Games, there's a closing ceremony, they nominate someone to carry the American flag in, typically someone who's done well athletically. But when they nominated me to carry this flag in, this object that I was so passionate about, into the sold out bird's nest and flashes going everywhere and representing the US delegation, I knew that that participation medal that I had, it was no longer something I wanted to chuck out the window. It was something that resembled resilience and overcoming an obstacle that you never think you're gonna have to overcome. So after Beijing, came back home and thought, well now what, how can you beat that? How can you beat going to the Paralympic Games, carrying the flags in and um, just trying to figure out what was next? What was next was starting my career back up. So in the field of prosthetics, so fitting other amputees with artificial limbs and literally being able to give them their life back and show them what is possible. Becoming a member of the board of directors for the Wounded Warrior Project, whose mission is to honor and empower this generation of wounded warriors and being passionate about getting back to this generation of wounded warriors. But I knew I wasn't done with athletics. Once an athlete, always an athlete. And there was a group called the Challenge Athletes Foundation that invited me out to do a triathlon. Triathlon. I thought a marathon was crazy. I thought swimming, but now I was going to swim, bike, and run. But somehow they invited me out to San Diego, California. I went out. I did my first triathlon. I swam, I biked, I ran, I crossed that finish line, and I was hooked. I loved it. I loved the challenge of all three sports. I loved the challenge of getting the different prosthetics on and off. And turns out I wasn't so bad at it. In the past couple of years, I've been part of the paratriathlon national team. I've been able to compete around the world at world championships and, and, and win three of them. And a quick favorite story was my very first world championship. It ha happened to be September 11th of 2010. It was, in it was in Budapest, Hungary. And it brought me back to those days at Walter Reed, and I wanted to live my life for those that gave that ultimate sacrifice. The horn went off. I swam. I biked. I ran as fast as I could. The finish line was across this beautiful bridge, and this gentleman handed me this American flag. I knew I wasn't first, and I finally got to cross this finish line. First place, September 11th, USA on my back. I got to stand up on that podium, get that gold medal, hear that national anthem, and talk about living in the moment, and being in that moment, and realizing the impact of it. And then the following year, back in Beijing, China for World Championships and wanting to redeem my performance from the Paralympics. And the same thing happened, crossed that finish line first, this time made it even sweeter because second and third place were also USA and we got to see three American flags go up with the USA sweep. And then the next day, or the next year in New Zealand, becoming a three-time paratriathlon world champion. And I'll tell you that standing on top of that podium, that never gets old. And then last year, wanted to kind of take things up a notch and 
um, attempt an Ironman. And an Ironman, if you know what an Ironman is, it's 140.6 miles. So you swim 2.4 miles, you bike 112, and then you run a marathon. And you do it all in one day, you get 17 hours. And really just wanted to prove to myself that this huge athletic feat that I, would, I could do it and become a part of this prestigious Ironman club. So I swam. It wasn't about speed, just about getting through. You swim, you bike, you run, just putting one foot in front of the other, trying whatever you can do to stay upright in those last miles. And then getting to that finish line and hearing the roar of the crowd, the noise is deafening. And running through that finish, suddenly you feel like you're flying. And then crossing through that finish line and hearing the words, Melissa Stockwell, you are an Iron Man. Made it all worth it. All that pain, all those long hours of training, and just being able to achieve that goal that I had put so much time and energy and, and heart into. So it's been 10 years since I lost my leg. And I like to say I've done more in my life with one leg than I ever would have done with two. I've had new opportunities. I've had a newfound love for life. And I'm really just proud to show what I'm capable of doing off wherever I go. I've had some pretty great opportunities. I've been able to dance with President Bush, <laughs> along with ride a mountain bike with him. I even got a presidential kiss. <laughs> I've been able to share my story with the viewers of Katie Couric. Been able to fist bump with Tom Brokaw. <laughs> been able to stand in a living room with all five living presidents on a day that wasn't about politics, but it was about honoring a great man and the opening of his library, and standing there and just realizing that it restored my faith in America and humanity, and that we truly do live in the greatest country in the world. Been able to share a laugh with the First Lady, say hello to our current president before a a bike ride through Washington, D.C. But what I'm most proud of through all that is starting an organization called Dare to Try Paratriathlon Club. And it's for athletes with disabilities. It's getting them to the starting line of a triathlon through providing equip adaptive equipment, training, coaching, and really showing them what is possible. And seeing the confidence that carries over from you know, a, a child to their family and just realizing that their child, whether they're in a wheelchair or they are missing a limb, that they can still get out there and live a normal life. Like I said, not, it's not about a disability, it's about their ability. My life is better now than it has ever been. Proud amputee, a proud American. I've learned a number of things along the way. Number one, that life is short. Number two, that a dog can also be a woman's best friend. Right, Jake? <laughs> and for all you ladies out there, that toenail polish does come off a prosthetic foot. <laughs> but I want to summarize for you quick just what my story has taught me. I want to inspire all of you to be greater than the people that you already are because my story has inspired me to go on and to do great things. Ten years ago, I realized that life never goes as planned. There are twists, there are turns, there are roadblocks, there are obstacles. But the best of us accept those surprises. We dedicate ourselves to pushing through them, and in doing that, we make ourselves better. Secondly, you should, all, should always believe in yourself. Believe in yourself even when you doubt yourself. Don't let a temporary setback swallow up any sort of inner strength or positive attributes that you have. Push through with confidence and faith. And succeeding in life means embracing change. And change is hard. Overcoming your fears, which change is often one of. I can tell you that my changes weren't easy. But you take those changes head on. You turn them into something desirable. Turn them into something positive. Don't be afraid, but do it. And then fourth, don't think that you're alone. We're all part of a bigger team here, whether it's your family, it's your friends, it's your teammates, your coaches, your teachers, whatever it may be. When I look back at the teams that helped me out along the way, I'm in awe. Surround yourself with good people, believe in them, trust in them, because all of us are in this life together. And then last, the glass might seem half empty, but it's always half full. And if you start each day with a positive outlook, it might end up being your best day yet. Stay confident and optimistic. Embrace the things that come your way, and you'll find your own desirable, you'll find your own desirable difficulties along the way. I just told you my story from Baghdad to Beijing, and I'm proud of it. I'm proud of my story. And I hope that if all of you had the chance to come up and to tell me your story, 
that you'd be proud of it because life is too short for you not to be. So it's crazy to think that I'm already beyond Baghdad to Beijing and I'm, I'm excited to think what's coming next. I can tell you that he is going to be awesome. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. I was just telling her that was absolutely amazing. I'm Dan Malthrop. I'm the chief executive here at the City Club of Cleveland. Thank you all so much for being here. Today at the City Club, we're enjoying a special program featuring Melissa Stockwell, Paralympian and Iraq War veteran. We'll return to our speaker momentarily for our traditional City Club question and answer period, and we encourage you to formulate your questions for our speaker now and ask that your questions be brief and to the point so we can get to as many as possible. We welcome all of you here and those joining us via our live webcast, which is sponsored by the University of Akron. You should be sure to tune into our Friday forums on 90.3 WCPN, WVIZ PBS, and 104.9 WCLV IdeaStream, our primary media partner, or one of the many radio stations across the country that carry City Club programs. Television broadcasts of, City, of the City Club are made possible by Cleveland State University and PNC. This Friday, August 29th, the City Club welcomes Ohio State Senator Peggy Lehner, for more information about our upcoming and any of our past forums, please visit us online at cityclub.org. Today's program is part of the Key Bank Diversity Thought Leadership Series, funded by a generous gift from Key Bank. We thank you very much for your support. Today, we also welcome guests at tables hosted by CMC Veterans Docket, Facing History New Tech High School, the guests of Bob and Sally Grease, Key Bank, and the Lewis Stokes Cleveland VA Medical Center. We thank you all for your support and for joining us today. Today's program is the Robert D. Grease Forum on Inspiration, made possible by a generous endowment gift from his wife, Sally Grease, and the Grease Foundation. Bob and Sally, would you please stand to be recognized? Talk about inspiration. Thank you, Bob, for bringing Melissa here. It's a great idea. This turned out absolutely wonderfully. We'd like to return now to our speaker for our traditional City Club question and answer period. We welcome questions from everyone, including guests. Holding microphones today, our content associate, Teddy Eisenberg, and our director of programming, Stephanie Jansky. Do we have our first question? Jake also answers. <laughs> Melissa, could you um, tell us who were the people that were most helpful for you in working through your desirable difficulties and how they were helpful? Yeah, definitely. So I feel very fortunate. I had a really great support system. Uh, my family and friends were there from day one. They kind of dropped everything that they were doing. And um, if I was ever having a bad day or a bad moment, they were the ones that said, it's going to be OK. It's going to be better. And being at Walter Reed, I was able to look to those that had come ahead of me, and I could see that, you know, that their life was going on. Or I would look to other females that had similar injuries and saw the great things they were doing and just had them for inspiration. So it's all about putting things in perspective and staying optimistic and really believing in yourself. Uh, yes. Please bear with me. I, I wrote this down so I wouldn't stumble. I've got two very brief comments and a question. Uh, you epitomize the Army slogans of Army Strong and Be All You Can Be. Uh, on behalf of a grateful nation and a fellow, fellow veteran, I thank you for your service. Thank you. Thank you. My question to you is, uh, you obviously have always been driven to succeed, but do you feel the circumstances of your experiences have instilled a new resolve reminiscent of the Irving Berlin song from the play, Annie, Get Your Gun. Anything you can do, I can do better. <laughs> oh. Well, I am a competitor. <laughs> we'll keep the gun somewhere else. But um, 
you know, it's definitely, so I think after, you know, losing a limb, you never expect, I mean, I never, if you told me 10 years ago I'd be up here, you would, I would have thought you were crazy because you never think things are going to happen the way that they do. But it's, um, you know, it's, it's one, me going out and doing the things I do is really trying to prove to myself that I can still do the things I want to do and to kind of prove to whoever else wants to look on that losing a limb doesn't stop you from doing anything. I'm not sitting in a dark room with the lights off and feeling sorry for myself, but I'm out here, you know, living a very active and fulfilling life and just really happy to have the opportunity to do that. Yes, Lieutenant Stockwell, it was a very interesting program and the military was much part of your life. Uh, saying that, what are your thoughts and position on compulsory military training, both for men and women? About combining them together? No, just compulsory military training for not only men, but women also. Back when I was in the Army, it was men only. <laughs> men only. Um, I'm all about females being out there. where if, if a female can prove themselves to be where a man can be, then personally I think they should be allowed to do just that. I mean, that's my personal opinion. Um, you know, everyone has their opinion, and obviously they have to prove themselves physically and mentally, but I think, I think it's a good thing. Hello, thank you for being here today. I enjoyed your message. Uh, you've done more in 10 years than you would have done in your lifetime. That's a nice quote. Um, tell me two questions. Well, what was your undergrad degree in? And second, well, how did you overcome the obstacles? Which was the hardest sport, swimming or bike riding? I would think bike riding, but sure. if you would tell <laughs> me, I'd like to know. Uh, my undergrad degree was in communications. So going back to school for prosthetics and um, had to take a lot of those science classes that I wasn't so fond of. Um, what was harder, swimming, I, I, so I've always been, I've always loved the water, so swimming was never really too much of an issue. I do not swim in circles, contrary to popular belief. I, I don't wear my prosthetic leg, so I'm still, I'm, but I'm still able to swim, swim straight. Um, Biking, actually, not, not too bad. Once you get up and get the balance, it actually comes pretty quickly. I do wear a prosthetic leg when I bike. Um, I would say that running might have been the most difficult because just the, you know, it's just I'm, I was so used to running with both of my legs and then having to put a prosthetic on. It's a unnatural motion. Ten years later, that's all I think of now. But when I think of running, but um, I would say running was probably the most difficult. Um, first, just a comment. You know, thank you so much for your service. And uh, I was overseas in the same area you were just after you got there, so. In a big, big way, thank you so much for setting a precedent of, you know, we had the armor, we had the things um, that was necessary to keep us safe. Um, for people like you, you paid the path as a fellow service member. And because of your sacrifice and what you've did, um, I can say that a lot of us had a lot more protection. So, you know, you're a hero in more ways than one. Um, but for my question, um, as a service member, as a combat veteran and a patriot of this country, what is your advice to all the agencies, uh, veteran support groups, uh, community providers, and uh, organizations out there who are standing uh, at ready trying to service all the returning service members. Okay. What can we do? What haven't we done well? What can we do better to make sure all of you, our heroes, returning home have the best care, the best support, the best things possible that we could possibly do? Sure. Um, you know. Fortunately, in this day and age, there's a lot, there's a lot of programs that, that serve veterans and wounded veterans. And um, if, I, feel, I feel like I could think of anything I would want to do from, you know, deep sea fishing to whatever, whatever else it may be, and there would be a program out there for it to happen. Um, as a wounded soldier, I know I, I have to be sometimes be proactive with it because, you know, especially living in a, in a remote area, a lot of those soldiers that come home, unfortunately, might fall through the cracks. So I think, you know, the service organizations is just trying to find a way to engage everybody, which is a lot easier said than done because, you know, if someone's sitting at home, how do you know where they are, what they're doing, but trying to, you know, in, in engage everybody and almost having someone, almost like a mentorship program also, because if you go to someone and they're not quite sure, you, you want them to go learn how to ride a bike, but they don't think they can ride a bike, but they can. They just have to go and prove to themselves that they can. So to have a, some sort of mentor assigned to them to go with them and kind of be there while they do it until they kind of get their feet on the ground. So, 
you know, we're, we're very fortunate that there's a lot out there, but, you know, there is definitely more that can be done as far as impacting everybody, making sure everybody is, is included. And I wish I had a better answer as to how to make that happen. Melissa, first, thank you. Very inspirational for all of us in any phase of our lives. <laughs> so I want to thank you for that. Talk to me about the prosthesis. Um, yeah. That business has uh, been evolving through technology, and I know that prosthesis you have on is probably a lot more powerful than any of us can imagine. It, it, it is, and I will share with you some, ex some cool stuff it does. So um, I actually charge my leg every night. So let's like you would charge a cell phone or a computer. Not every night, I'm sorry, every third night. So if I don't charge it, if the battery runs out, it'll become stiff like a peg leg, and I won't be able to walk. So it's basically like a smartphone. It's a smart leg. So what it does is it knows how much I weigh. So when I put 80, when I step through and put 80% of my weight on my toe, the knee releases and it automatically swings through. I don't have to do a lot of hip movement. You can set in a computer settings as to how high the heel rises and comes up in front, how far and fast it goes out. I can actually let myself lowering down a stair step over step or sitting into a chair and it really helps me walk as naturally as possible believe it or not i have a remote control that i can point at this bad boy and click a button and it beeps it vibrates and it can go into two different modes that i can set independently the first one that would, my way set it it's, it's a free swing so i could get on a bike i could ride a bike not competitively but just kind of recreationally around the neighborhood the third mode is set at just a little bit, a little bend, because this winter, last winter, I was trying cross-country skiing or trying ice skating, and then it, it allows you to do just that. So, pretty remarkable piece of technology. A lot of the veterans coming back, um, you know, we don't like to take no for an answer, so it's really pushed the technology further and faster than it ever could have been. And um, next year, they're actually coming out with a leg that cooks you dinner. <laughs> so I'm pretty, pretty pumped about that. Just kidding. It's not going to cook you dinner. But it's pretty great. The technology is amazing. It's come a long way, and it's pretty remarkable what, it's, what they're able to, able to do. Melissa, would you tell us a little more about the Wounded Warrior Project? Yes. Where am I looking? Oh, yeah. <laughs> hello, right in front of me. Yeah. Uh, tell us a little more about that. I know there are so many organizations that keep sending out requests for funds and money, and some, you know, how do we tell the legitimate ones from the other ones and how do we tell the ones that really help the people sure um you know that's a good that's a good question there's a lot of organizations out there a lot that claim that they help wounded veterans um you know how you can tell i mean other than you know whatever they put in a brochure i can tell you that the wounded warrior project online you can look at the website you can see the breakdown of, of the numbers of the percentage that goes to programming and that gives you a pretty good idea of where the dollars go and obviously the more money that goes to the programming the better Wounded Warrior Project, um, like I said, the mission is to honor and empower this generation of wounded, of, of wounded veterans through an extremely wide range of programs, whether it is um, anything from meeting a soldier off the battlefield to helping financially with their family to job placement after they're recovering to schooling to advocating on the Hill to passing laws for caregivers um, to getting soldiers involved in sports or um, or or PTSD retreats for themselves and their caregivers. The list goes on and on and on. So I'm a, a big believer in the Wounded Warrior Project and all the thousands that they have helped. And, you know, I think that the best advice is if you get something, just to, to research it a little bit. Don't, don't just believe what's in the brochure that you get, but research it a little bit online to determine if they are, the, if they are doing what they say that they do. Melissa, thanks for inspiring us today. And I wonder if you could tell us about the role your service animal plays in your life. And also, uh, tell us a little bit about your plans for parenting. Yes. Um, that you learn as you go, right? <laughs> so, um, yes. Yeah, so Jake, my, he's hiding back here. So I got Jake through an organization called Vet Dogs, and they provide service dogs to wounded veterans. I've had them for about five years. They train them from when they're born to when they're two. When they're two, I went to New York. I had a week-long training with him, and that, then he became mine. So what he can do is if I get home at night, if I take my prosthetic leg off, he's able to bring me my crutches from anywhere in the house. He can bring them to me so I don't have to hop. He was taught to help me upstairs if there's no handrail. If I fall, he can brace himself. I can push up off of him. I, I'm not full. I, obviously, you can see I'm pretty independent, so I'm not solely dependent on him. He's more my companion. Um, he runs with me. He comes with me. He's always my plus one. Um, and he's pretty great. If anyone has a dog, you, you, you know the, the feeling. 
In the summer, you know, I, I proudly show off my prosthetic leg, and a lot of times it'll take the attention off of my leg and it's onto the dog. Not that I mind people looking at my leg or asking questions, but sometimes you just don't want to talk about it over and over again. So um, he's just pretty great. Jake is tired from all the commotion <laughs> last night with, with um, Kramer, the grease dog. So, and then, and then you asked about parenting. So parenting, um, so I'm due on Thanksgiving, so I have about three months left, and um, I, if anyone has any advice, let me have it. <laughs> I, don't, I don't really know. Um, I am having a boy, and um, figure it out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's a little bit of an added challenge with the prosthetic, obviously. I'm in the, getting up in, in the middle of the night trying to figure out how it's going to work, and obviously I'm not going to hop around with the child or on crutches, so, you know, trying to figure out the best way to, to manage all that, but... You know, other people have done it before me, so I'm sure we'll figure it out. Hi, Melissa. Thanks for being here, and thanks to the City Club for putting this on. Um, I'm Lisa Followay, representing the Adaptive Sports Program of Ohio. We're also Paralympic, Paralympic Sport Club Ohio, excuse me, and I see Paralympic Sport Club Cleveland here is in the room. Could you shed some um, light on the disparity of adaptive sport progr programming for people with disabilities um, compared to people who don't have disabilities and the opportunities for them to engage in athletics? And also share how people can support this sure. sort of thing. So just the, the amount of programming you're asking? or. versus with. Um, you know, I, I, I might be biased when I talk here because I'm very, I'm very involved in the whole, in the programs with athletes with disabilities. I'm, I, you know, at least in Chicago, know quite a few of them, familiar with kind of a few around the nation. So in my mind, there, there could always be more, but there, there is a good amount of, of programs for athletes with disabilities. Um, you know, we do have a lot of athletes that might travel to Chicago to do a triathlon with Dare to Try, and they always wonder, well, what goes on? What can I do back in my hometown? And it's tough. If they live in an area where there is no programming for anyone with a disability, how do you engage them to stay active? And what we always suggest, or we, we try to reach out to a program that is for athletes with, with no disability, so just a general athletic programming, asking if they would be interested in starting a program, if, if kind of mirroring off of ours or another one around the nation so that person can be included. So, you know, in, inclusion is, is always, always an issue. And, you know, if, if I, here I am missing my leg, if I weren't already an athlete, I'd be really intimidated to go and to run with a group of able-bodied runners around the track just because I'm not sure what I'm able to do. So what we would want them to do is to talk with a coach and tell them what the situation is in hopes that they would kind of work with them to include them in it. Hi there, thanks. Um, thanks again for being here, like everyone has said. Hopefully it's an easy question. So everybody has a bad day or a bad hour. Do you have a favorite mantra that helps you pull out of that? Um, I, have, I feel like I have a few. You know, I, I'm, I'm very, so I'm very, I, I love America. I love our country. I'm very passionate about um, the soldiers and what, there's the freedom to live here. And a lot of times if I'm having a bad moment, I think about how lucky I, I am. I've had the privilege to, you know, go through Walter Reed and to see that I, I can be much worse off. So it's not so much a mantra. It's just kind of thinking about how, how lucky I am. And I like to think that you should never can, I tell myself that if you, if you're comparing yourself to others and you're getting down on yourself, Never compare yourself to others. Be happy with who you are, what you do, and just be proud of, of who you are instead of trying to compare. So not really a mantra, just a, just a few thoughts. <laughs> Melissa, thank you again so much for being here today. The, earlier in, the, in your talk, you, you mentioned the, the soldiers who served under you um, for, I guess it was about a month, mm -hmm. but maybe early, more back in the US. How are they now? Where are they now? What are they doing? And, and have, did they make it through? Yeah, um, you know, so over in Iraq, so I had a platoon that I, that I led that were 20 soldiers, and fortunately all of them made it back unharmed, and uh, many of them have gotten out of the military. Some have been deployed again multiple times. Thanks to uh, social media, Facebook, Twitter, I'm able to keep in touch with a lot more than I normally would be, and a lot of them have gone back to school, are out in, you know, be in successful careers, um, but you always have this bond. I mean, there's always this camaraderie, whether you know, a story on the news or a picture of a, 
of one of your platoon members and it kind of gets passed around and you know I was a platoon leader but I feel like I'm was kind of you know in somewhat just a, a mother of them or just kind of being able to to see where they all all are now it's um it's pretty great but they've all been they've all they're all they all seem to be doing pretty pretty well the ones I keep in touch with thankfully Today we're joined at the City Club by a wonderful American Paralympian, Iraq War veteran, Melissa Stockwell. You're excellent. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your example. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We are adjourned. <laughs>